And uh, so I was doing that. And then time passed. And then Bill said to me one day, he called me up and he said, there's a film you ought to audition for. I said, I'm not ready to audition for him. No this, way. Is this Adam at 6 a.m.? Yes, yeah. And I said, no way am I ready to audition for a film. And and so he, I said, no, I'm not going to do it. I would just embarrass you and me, everybody. No. Uh, Bill kept calling me for two weeks and saying, really, really, I really think you should do this. They're seeing an awful lot of girls. You're perfect for this. I'm like, mm, no. And finally, he said, you just have to do it. I'm sorry. Just take a leap of faith again and just go do it. And I said, oh, okay, if you put it that way. And so I did. I went and I auditioned for this film, which was called Adam at 6 a.m. It's a very long time ago, but you can still see the film. It's a sweet, sweet film. And uh, nobody was cast. Nobody. None of the cast. None of the roles were cast. And uh, Steve McQueen was producing it for his company, Solar Productions. And I knew that, uh, but I hadn't met him. And I, and I, he was hard to think of this now, though. It's so strange. But he was of my parents' generation. He was their age, right? And so to me, I hadn't seen a lot of his movies. I think I had seen one, maybe. So I didn't have that kind of um, scary awe that I would have had, maybe if it was more in my age group or it was somebody, you know, younger. Um, I didn't. I didn't have that. And so I auditioned. I had five auditions, and they started with five hundred girls and got down to five, and. Um, I met him on a Saturday morning and I didn't know I was going to meet him. And uh, I had been through three auditions, I think by that time, the fourth was coming up and they had called it down to, I don't know what that, 50 maybe. And um, and so I got a call on Saturday morning and I was out in my yard, my little, little crappy yard. And I was digging and planting flowers because I've always been a gardener. And um, and I get this call, I hear the phone ring, I rush in the house, answer the phone. And um, they said, you need to come over to the office right away, uh, to the solar offices. And I said, oh, okay, okay. And I thought that was odd, Saturday is odd, right? And uh, so I, I said, I'll come in there in an hour. I need to take a shower. Nope, you don't have time. You have 10 minutes to get here. Like, oh, I thought, oh, well, I kind of, in my head, I, I, th I thought, oh, they probably want to give me some more sides. Those are audition pages that you get probably want to give me some more sides and uh, they're probably closing the office early and they just want me to get there so they can have their Saturday and I understood that and so I just jumped on my car dirty you know uh, dirt under my nails sweaty hair greasy you know because uh, it was hot and um and rushed over there and bounded up the stairs because I've been there now so many times and bounded upstairs and yanked open the door and there was Steve McQueen. And it was like, oh, hi. And it's, hi. And he said, um, hi, I'm Steve. And I went, yeah. And uh, I said, I'm, I'm Lee, Lee Purcell. I got a call to come over. I, am I going to pick up some signs or what? And he said, no, we're going to talk. I said, okay. And so we uh, talked for about three hours. People were coming and going and whatever. And we just kept talking. And we talked about everything, literally everything in life that you could think to talk about. Talking about our childhoods, our respective childhoods. They were in a strange way, similar, very, actually very similar, even though not materially, but experientially, they were very similar. And um, and not uh, not great childhoods, and which was okay, because we were both like, hmm, okay, fine, so what? And, um, and we talked about motorcycles because I rode motorcycles and he rode motorcycles and talked about acting, talked about life, just talked, you know, and it was easy. It was really easy to talk to him. He was the easiest person in the world to talk to because he had no pretense. Here he was, the biggest movie star in the world, really, at the time. He had no pretense. He was just in an old, I don't know, a sweatshirt and some ripped up jeans, you know, and, uh, and we just had a great talk. And I knew it was a test. I knew it the whole time. And um, and so that was it. I went home, prepared for number four audition. I did number four audition. It went well. And I got a call. I was in the final five. And we were going to do uh, a screen test. And that was a bizarre screen test. I've done a lot of screen tests. It was pretty bizarre. And um, 
we were all driven out to this, to, I think the Disney Ranch, one of the, maybe one of, one of the studio ranches. And we, and we were in the same car. We all crammed into this one car and all five of us. And um, uh, one, one girl was a friend of mine and um, it's very weird. And then, and there were no dressing rooms. There was nothing because it was an outdoor scene. Right. So we would just kind of go sit on a log until it was our turn. And then we would do our scenes, you know, while everybody else watched. It was like so strange. And um, then we got back in the car and we all went home and that was that. And then I got a call pretty quick, maybe uh, two days. And then I got in the role and it was, I was just floored. I, even though I knew, I knew I was going to get the role by that time. By the fifth, by that screen test, I knew, I knew I was going to get the role. I just knew it. That's how I ended up being mentored by Steve McQueen, because he called me and he said, uh, I want you to, you know, come to the office, you know, frequently, we're going to do this, I'm going to tell you this, because I know you're new. And I was, oh, boy, was I new, and uh, raw. And uh, I said, okay, and I would go there pretty much every day, sit, and, and when he had time, I would talk to him, and then we would work out. And because uh, he said, you're too thin, you need to be, you know, more heavier for this girl, but not fat. And I said, okay. And I started like eating like fried chicken and brownies and whatever. And, and he said, and we're going to work out. So if you don't, um, you know, gain weight incorrectly, I said, fine. So we would do every day, uh, kind of this martial arts kind of exercises. And one day I said to him, so where are you learning all these exercises? And he said, oh, you know, I do martial arts and my martial art, my martial arts instructor, uh, teaches me these exercises. And I said, oh, great, you know, and I never asked his name, the martial arts guy, and year, <laughs> you probably know where I'm going. And then years and years later, when I was interviewed, I'm in a lot of in several books about Steve. And um, uh, and the interviewer, I told him that story, and he said, you don't know who that was, the martial? I said, no. And he said, it was Bruce Lee. I'm like, oh, oh, I, I didn't know that. So I was kind of trained by Bruce Lee, uh, one person removed, which was Steve McQueen. And um, and so I actually do some of those exercises to this day. And because uh, they were really good exercises. And and then he just taught me, oh, he taught me so much, just so much. Yeah, he was, he was incredibly smart. I don't know how many people really know that about me. He was incredibly smart. And he was uh, perceptive. He was empathy, had a lot of empathy, and uh, and he was driven like nobody I've ever seen driven, until until Tom Cruise came along, and that was like, oh my gosh, he's like Steve, he's got that that drive and that ambition and that intelligence to back it all up, and that was who Steve was, and he died too young. He died at fifty, and um, he only died ten years. He died ten years later. I was crushed and destroyed and, and he was the best. And I will always, my whole life, I'm always grateful to him because he started, I would have, I would have had a career, but he opened the doors for me that nobody else could have. So it was like being blessed by the Pope, you know? So that was Steve. Is there one piece of advice that sticks out? that he gave you that you feel may have made the most impact on you? Boy, that, that, that's kind of a tough one because there was so much over a long period of time. And I remember a lot of them and some of them, I just keep to myself. Um, but one is, one is that always, always be, always understand that everybody's equal on a set, whether they are craft service where they are, whether they are the big time producer, you treat everybody with the same respect and kindness. And that has stuck with me all my life. So I, I think that's really important. As I recall, Adam at 6 a.m. was one of Michael Douglas's first film roles. Um, yes. It, what do yes. you remember about the day you met him? I don't remember anything about the day. <laughs> Um, but Michael was not a movie star. Yeah. I, I think it was his third film, I think. And um, actually, I was cast before he was. 
And so I, I, then I went through the audition process and as the female lead with all the guys, there were a lot of guys and uh, great, great young actors, all of them, every single one. You could have hired any of them really. But then one day, and I was doing screen tests with them and I was doing what's called chemistry tests and I was just reading in the office and whatever. And then one day Steve says to me, well, we found Adam. And I went, oh, well, who is it? And, he, and it was so funny looking back on it. He said, um, it's Kirk Douglas' son. I thought, oh, what's his name? And he said, Michael. And I went, okay. And he said, you're going to meet him really soon because you're going to start doing, you know, rehearsing and you're going to start doing uh, reading script together. And, and I did. And, you know, we were just, we were just two young actors and, you know, looking to, you know, have a career. And he had a leg up, you know, because he was, you know, Hollywood royalty, but he didn't, he didn't depend upon that ever. And he was actually raised by his mother, really, elsewhere. And then, and then, uh, came to Hollywood and he and his dad were very, very close, but, but it was his mother that raised him when he was a youngster because he and his mother, uh, his dad, and his mother were divorced and, but he was very close to his father. And of course, then I ended up starring in a movie with his father, like, I don't know how many years later, 10 or, or something. And it was, that was like a really interesting kind of full circle, you know, cause he would talk about his dad. And, uh, and I knew his dad was Spartacus and all of that. And, um, and then he said, you know, we, we talked about a lot, Michael and I did, because we were, you know, kids. And, and then, and also they sent us, we did the film together, and then they sent us on a huge tour throughout the United States uh, for the film, to promote the film. And that was really something, really, really something. And, um, and one day he, uh, he said, you know, what I really want to do is produce. And I said, well, okay, then you should. And, and he said, yeah, I have this uh, project that was my dad's and he can't get it done, but someday I'm going to get it done. And of course it was one flew over the cuckoo's nest and he, he sure did get it done. And, you know, he was, he was really smart. He was a smart, smart, smart guy. And his dad was really smart. And, um, and, and, and that was great. That was really great. You've, as I mentioned in the intro, you've worked with, I mean, so many of the greatest names in the business, both directors and actors. And, and one that sticks out to me mm -hmm. is, uh, Orson Welles. Oh, um, <laughs> uh, he's such a larger than life figure in the history of cinema to most of us. What can you tell us about your experiences with him? It was the second film I did. Uh, the first one was Adam. The second one was uh, this terrible, terrible hook film. But, you know, I was young and Adam hadn't come out yet and I needed a job. 